here tonight, Professor Richard Hartwig of Tavern University in Texas. Professor Hartwig was a visiting fellow at AMU in 2008, and we are delighted that he has chosen to come back and join us. Tonight, he shall be speaking to us regarding his proposal for regional representation at the United Nations Security Council. So please join me in welcoming Professor Hartwig. Well, I would like to thank the really wonderful people at UNCLOS, um, the academics who were willing to talk to me. Um, I'd particularly like to thank the director of the South American Koala section of Australia, the Australian Foreign Ministry, and the ambassadors and diplomats and other ambassadors and other diplomats from Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Venezuela, Chile, Ecuador. Colombia, Paraguay, and Mexico. I apologize for not talking to all of the, uh, the Latin American representatives, not asking all of the Latin American representatives who've come to talk to me, uh, but I haven't had time. So it's been quite a remarkable experience uh, talking to all these, these folks, and they've helped me a lot and coalesce some of my ideas in the last couple of weeks. So some of my ideas have changed considerably in the last couple of weeks. Uh, needless to say, none of the people I've talked to bear any responsibility for what I'm about to say. Uh, the former U.S. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson, American U.S. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson, once said that the United Nations gets along on protocol, alcohol, and geritol. Uh, I don't know if anybody takes geritol today, but it's supposed to be good for tired blood in those days. I find it amusing that informal documents produced by the U.N. Security Council are called non-papers. <laughs> Some of your professors ask you to produce a non-paper, at least anyway, you know what it is now. The temporary members of the Security Council, of course the Security Council of the UN, there's a General Assembly of all countries in the United Nations, each of which has one vote, which is also a bit amusing. And then there's the Security Council with five permanent members and ten temporary members. The uh, five permanent members of the Security Council are the United States, Great Britain, France, Russia, and China. The temporary members are chosen, five of them are chosen every year. And of course, Australia has the honor of now being on the uh, Security Council. Argentina is on the Security Council. Now these countries are chosen by, from five regional groups. Uh, two of these groups make absolutely no geographic sense today. Part of this is because the United Nations was created during the Second World War, actually, it's planned during the Second World War. And this is before the colonial empires disappeared. One of these groups is called the WIOG, the Western European and Other Group. This is a regional grouping which includes countries from four continents plus two islands. It includes New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and Israel. Now Israel, get this, Israel is a permanent temporary member of the WIOG group. The Asia Pacific, Asian and Pacific group includes such oriental countries as Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Cyprus, Qatar, and Kuwait. Now there's no Middle East group, which creates a lot of problems in the UN, and I'll get to this. Uh, the proposal I'm uh, talking about today does have a Middle East group, which I think um, has some great advantages to it. Now, most of the subjects which come before the Security Council are definitely not amusing. Things like the uh, ongoing civil war in Syria. And we haven't been doing such a great job in dealing with this. And I would say part of the problem, I mean not all of the problem, but part of the problem, I would say, is the structure of the United Nations Security Council. Now let me switch to the relationship between the Security Council and process of globalization. Globalization creates interdependence. Remember a couple of years ago, I live in Kingsville, Texas, a small city in South Texas, and I was looking to buy a new car. So I went to the local Ford dealer and I looked at a car. The first car I looked at had a, a motor which was made in Brazil and it was assembled in Mexico and this was supposed to be an American car. <laughs> now, a couple of years ago, we had this terrible tsunami uh, resulting from an earthquake off the uh, coast of Japan, and this affected car production in the United States. I went to the, uh, the Aldi grocery store, 
couple of weeks ago and bought a package of frozen vegetables. And I was a bit surprised to see that it was a product of China, frozen vegetables from China. Anyway, this interdependence makes it harder to isolate problems and harder for any individual country to solve problems. It seems to me that the world has one large set of problems in many respects today. And it's very difficult to, for countries to solve them individually. A nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula would affect the entire world, not simply the Korean Peninsula, even though if bombs were limited to the Korean Peninsula. The threat of climate change certainly affects us all. Anybody have any lingering doubts about this? Professors Will Steffen and Frank Jotsu of the ANU Climate Change Institute uh, could help you resolve any of those doubts. In the old days, if the United States trashed its environment, it wouldn't affect the United States. It wouldn't affect Australia. Today, it does affect Australia. Terrorism, plagues, international crime all require international cooperation, if not global solutions. The interdependence of international finance is extremely obvious today. You look at books like uh, Too Big to Fail or The Big Short. Michael Mandelbaum wrote a book called The Case for Goliath, in which he argued that, quote, the world has a greater need for governance in the 21st century than ever before. And I would say that this is, a, to a large extent, the result of interdependence. At the same time, we have movements like the Tea Party movement in my country who argue for less government. But of course, government and governance are not exactly the same thing. Anyway, it seems to me that the world is deficient in organizations that can make effective and legitimate decisions about global problems. For example, the periodic meetings in the context of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Kyoto, Cancun, Copenhagen, and Durban have all come up short. So the world needs to limit climate change to two degrees Celsius by the end of the century, and it seems unlikely to do so. Now in 20 or 30 years, it seems to me that the world is gonna face a fantastic catastrophe. The world is gonna face a catastrophe if we don't do something about rising temperatures. And the only thing left to do will be geoengineering. Okay, geoengineering, putting mirrors in space or sulfites in space or water vapor from the oceans. But what world body could make this decision today? There isn't any, right? I mean, this is something that affects the entire world. How are you gonna make a decision like this? Calling a conference is not gonna work. Now, it seems to me that a reformed UN Security Council could make such a decision, and we need to make, create such an institution in the relatively near future. Now, this proposal I'll be talking about tonight is for the year 2020. I was here five years ago, presented this proposal, realized that you know, the conditions weren't there, perhaps for the year 2020. That might be in time to deal with something like climate change. Now, in recent years, there's been a tendency to go outside the Security Council because Security Council solutions haven't worked very well. For example, February 4th, 2012, Russia and China vetoed a resolution on Syria that was supported by all the other countries in the Council, which has 15 members. 1996, the United States uh, vetoed a decision, a vote. We had a 14 to 1 vote uh, to continue Boutros Boutros Ghali as uh, Secretary General of the United States. The United States vetoed it. Secretary General of the UN. The United States veto. This is ridiculous. To have one country be able to veto something which is supported by 14 other countries. Anyway, a crisis meeting on the Syria case, a crisis meeting of 80 countries was called by Friends of Syria held in Istanbul. Can you imagine? On a, on a short notice, you call together 80 countries and you try to make a decision like this? Obviously, it didn't work. The Israeli-Palestinian relationship is managed by the Quartet, the UN, the US, the EU, and Russia. Groups of friends or contract groups have dealt or tried to deal with crises in Namibia, El Salvador, Kosovo. It's a nightmare for diplomats. Plus, it's not very effective. Flexibility, yes, but coordination, continuity, no. Now, the United Nations is the major world organization, and the Security Council is its most important body. 
United Nations was created in 1945 at a conference in San Francisco. Now there was a prior conference in, in a state in Washington, D.C. called Dunbarton Oaks, where the, the, the winning powers, it looks like the powers are going to win the Second World War, got together. The Soviet Union, the United States, and Great Britain. So they, they pre-planned this. Then there was the big conference in, in uh, San Francisco in which uh, Australian uh, Minister of External Affairs, Sir Herbert Evatt, had an important role in strengthening the, uh, the General Assembly. Uh, details were hammered out at Yalta after the Dumbarton Oaks Conference between Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. Important to remember that there were only 51 signatories of the, uh, the original uh, United Nations. Now there are 193 countries. Now, ANU professor Ramesh Thakur, who is a former assistant secretary general of the United Nations, has written, quote, the United Nations is the symbol of an imagined and constructed community of strangers who have banded together to tackle the world's problems collectively and to work together cooperatively in the pursuit of shared goals. In this sense, the organization is first and foremost the repository of international idealism the belief that human beings belong to one family, inhabit the same planet, and have joint custodial responsibility to husband resources and protect the environment for all future generations of life on this planet." End quote. Now, the Security Council is charged with keeping the peace. It is the only international organization which can authorize the use of force, in a sense, it was created to prevent the globalization of war, which, of course, we had in World War I and World War II. But, of course, the big problem for the Security Council is that it's frozen in the power relationships of 1945. Germany and Japan were frozen out because they were the enemy powers. So we have these five countries, and they don't include important countries like Japan, Germany, who are the second and third largest contributors to the, the United Nations. Now, I think a really important point is that I would argue, and many other people argue, that an effective international organization must represent the real structure of power in the world if it is to be effective. Obviously, the Security Council does not represent the real structure of power in the world today. It also needs to be legitimate. Legitimacy is required for effectiveness, and the UNSC is not legitimate. Why should anybody pay, anybody in the Middle East pay attention to what the Security Council says? There are no Middle Eastern countries on the Security Council. Ramos Thakur again says, a, a re, un, an unreformed Security Council has been experiencing a steadily, steady eroding of international legitimacy which helps to explain the growing willingness of many state and non-state actors to openly defy its edict. Shashi Tharoor, who Indian diplomat who nearly became Secretary General of the UN, writes in an article called Security Council Reform, Past, Present, and Future, 2011, Ethics and International Affairs, he writes the following, quote, reform or die is a cliche that has been inflicted on many institutions. For the United Nations at this time and on this issue, the hoary phrase has the merit of being true. Now, I'd like to go through, briefly go through this uh, proposal for Security Council reform. It has the disadvantage of being complicated, uh, which is a serious disadvantage. Uh, the current proposals for reform have the advantage of being simple, but unworkable. But at least they're simple. People understand. One, you know, you can put more permanent members, whether you have uh, the veto power and so forth, they're simple, but they don't work. Anyway, let me see if I can go through this uh, quickly. So this is the, uh, the article published by the Dog Hammarskjöld Foundation, special issue of the Dog Hammarskjöld Foundation's journal called Critical Currents. So this is the, uh, the May uh, 2008 issue. Uh, this gentleman here, the, uh, the editor, uh, was uh, head of the German United Nations uh, foundation for uh, association for about 25 years. Now here is the uh, the article itself. This is again this article is part of a, a special issue of the journal. Now it's worth looking at this. 
Uh, here, Peter Walensky, Australia's permanent representative of the UN in 1991, writes, the UN Security Council reform will not be taken up until the Council's membership is so at odds with the modern world that the point is reached that this, this dysfunction undermines the legitimacy of the Council's decisions. And I think we've certainly reached that point. Now again, here's the, uh, the complicated part. I'll, I'll read this and see if this, this makes sense. A satisfactory reform of the United Nations Security Council, UNSC, is important but currently impossible given the veto power of the five permanent members and the absence of consensus among the other members of the UN. In 2004, a United Nations-sponsored high-level panel proposed two models for UNSC reform. Neither model is satisfactory and neither has been or is likely to be adopted. This paper advocates a radical restructuring of Security Council called the Regional Economic Proposal, REP, which would require revising the UN Charter, change from a unipolar to a multipolar world, and perhaps a major world crisis, like climate change, would be required for this proposal to become politically feasible. The required conditions may be present by 2020, if not earlier. 2020 is the year the high-level panel has suggested for a review of the composition of the Security Council. The REP suggests that representation in the Security Council should be determining, determined by objectively balancing the claims of one, legitimacy, two, power and wealth, and three, mutual advantage. I mean, every country in the world, or at least 99% of the countries in the world, have an interest in having a functioning Security Council. The REP plan envisions a UNSC composed of 10 geographic regions. Each region would be presided over by an anchor country or by co-anchor countries. Under normal conditions, a region's US rep UN representative could only vote on a particular issue if supported by countries representing 60% of its population and 60% of its GDP measured in terms of purchasing power parity. This is really important. The plan doesn't work if you don't use purchasing power parity. In emergency situations, only anchor and co-anchor countries would have the vote. There would be no veto power. Regions with at least 18% of the combined GDP, PPP, of all regions would receive two UNSC votes each on a permanent basis. This would currently give both Northern America and Europe two votes. East Asia may qualify for a second vote by 2020 if not before. The other regions would have one vote each. Additional regions may qualify for two votes if the percentages of the combined GDP, PPP, reach and maintain the 18% level in two consecutive decades. The composition of the regions would be subject to revision by the UNSC with General Assembly approval every 20 years. Now, one, obviously, uh, this 18%, today I would lower that to 16%, uh, but this is obviously a politically negotiable figure. It's obviously a crucial figure. But essentially, these three regions are much, much larger than any of the other regions. Now, I probably completely confused you folks, but see if I can help a little bit uh, with this. Okay, so the idea here is to have 10 regions of the world. Say, Northern America is basically just the United States plus Puerto Rico. So basically, the United, this wouldn't be, really be a change. This would be a change simply on the nameplate. And the nameplate of the ambassador, instead of saying United States, would say Northern America. Um, Latin America countries south of Mexico and south, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa region, the Middle East, the region that doesn't exist now in the Security Council, South Asia, would be India and Nepal, Southeastern Asia, uh, the ASEAN countries, East Asia would be basically China, China plus North Korea, Northern Eurasia, Europe, and I created another. I sat in my office and created another region that felt like God, you know, so hey, let's, <laughs> let's, let's create a region here. So the other, the final region is uh, the Pacific, which includes New Zealand, Australia, Papua New Guinea, um, Japan, and South Korea. 
Now, one of the basic, one of the rules I was following in trying to do this is you want to separate countries with historic conflicts with each other. So Mexico and the United States, for example, uh, Pakistan and India, uh, China, China and Japan. Uh, the one case where I was not able to do that is Japan and South Korea, but at least they're both democracies and hopefully they can work together. Now, uh, Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand have worked together for a long time. Uh, the reason I put Canada in here too, one of the, the other reason is uh, I tried not to put a small country together with a big country because the small country is always going to get be outvoted. Mm -hmm. So Canada w with the United States, it would always be outvoted. Same thing with Mexico. Plus, I needed Canada for the other region. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, the idea here is that um, two or really three, three of these regions end up having two votes. The other regions get one vote each. And this really represents the structure of power today, with one little exception. Today, we have five countries on the Security Council. Uh, so basically, each of those five has 20% of the vote. So the United States would basically have the same position. It would be, instead of one out of five, would be one, two votes out of 13, really. Uh, China, same sort of thing. One country that loses a bit would be Russia. But actually, Russia uh, would get more than it deserves in the sense of it has a relatively small population, a declining population, plus a relatively small GDP. So for Russia to have you know, this one region and one vote the same as Latin America is being generous to Russia, it seems to me. Anyway, there's a lot more about this. This would be the uh, permanent chairs of the regions, the United States, Canada, India, European Union, you have to have a Europe, common seat for the European Union, Russia, and Japan. Now, the qualifications for having a permanent chair, you have to have more than 50% of the size points of the region. Now, the size points, you get one size point for every 10 million people in the population. You get one size point for every $40 billion GDP, PPP, as of 2008. So Japan, five years ago, Japan had 57% of the size points of the Pacific region. Now it's down to 52%. So as seems likely, in another five years or so, Japan will go down to half, go down to less than half of the, uh, the size points of the region. So Japan would go from being permanent chair to you know, co-chair, permanent co-chair, and then Australia, Canada, and South Korea would be rotating co-chairs. You notice that I put here four years, four years, two years, because the number of size points. So the, uh, the South Korea and Canada have approximately the same number of, the same combination of population and GDP. So they would serve four years, four years, and Australia is about half of that. Now for the Latin American case, you'd have Brazil, and then Mexico for five years, Argentina for three years, Colombia for, for two years. But the advantage of this system is that it's dynamic. It changes over time. The current Security Council can't change ever. So it's, as the population of, of Japan decreases and its relative economy, it loses power in this, in this structure. Now, to be able to vote, to be able to vote on the Security Council representing one of these regions, a region, the representative of that region, say if, uh, if Ambassador uh, Viagra were the uh, representative uh, of Latin American region at some point, the ambassador would have to say that on this particular issue, I have the support of countries with 60% of the population and 60% of the GDP measured in terms of purchasing power parity in the region. Therefore, I can vote. Now, with countries like you know United States and and China and India, uh, they have virtually the entire population and region. You know, they don't have any problem. But for the other regions, you would have to have a negotiations within the region. To you have a certain amount of support, then you can cast a vote. If you don't have the correct amount of support, you you lose your vote. And this would give the countries in the regions an incentive to work together, which I think is quite important. Okay, let me, let me leave this. I don't know if that's probably uh, is not sufficiently clear, but I need to go on. 
So I wanted to concentrate on the problem of implementation. I mean, it's nice to be able to draw something like this up in your office, but getting it implemented in the real world is an obviously difficult thing to do. Uh, for those of you who have a lot of your time on your hands, you might want to see Brian Cox, an article called United Nations Security Council Reform, Collected Proposals and Con Possible Consequences, South Carolina Journal of Law, Fall 2009, pages 88 to 128. It has a review of all these different proposals of Security Council reform, including this one. Now, the relationship between Latin America, finally getting to Latin America here. Latin America and the Security Council. Uh, Argentina and Guatemala are to be congratulated for having been chosen to represent Latin, Latin America in the Caribbean region in the UNSC. Colombia was on the Security Council 2011-2012 and they've done very important work. And I've gone around talking to the various ambassadors and found out what they've been, what they've been doing. Australia, of course, have just joined the council recently. However, in the entire history of the United Nations, there's never been a permanent member from Latin America, nor has there been a permanent member from Sub-Saharan Africa, nor has there been a permanent member from the Middle East, nor from South Asia, nor from Southeast Asia, nor from the Pacific, including Japan. This is obviously a ridiculous situation. Security Council has to be reformed, but we can't figure out how to do it. Uh, Japan and Germany, again, are the second and third largest financial contributors to the organization. Now, the prospects for Security Council reform. There's been no progress in the last 20 years. There were 16 years of something called the open-ended working group, often called the never-ending working group, uh, followed by five years of stalemated intergovernmental negotiations. Now, I can't imagine participating in this. I mean, it would drive you completely nuts. Uh, one of the ambassadors I talked to saying, said that uh, he, she, uh, uh, considered committing suicide after participating in disarmament negotiations in, in Geneva, and this would be something similar, it seems to me. Five years ago, I predicted no progress on this, and I was correct. My prediction for the next five years is that there's a 90% chance that nothing will happen, and a 10% chance that there will be some sort of Security Council reform, and that this will make things worse. <laughs> I don't think this is a very good you know, alternative. Now, why is reform unlikely? Amending the US, UN Charter requires two-thirds vote in the General Assembly, which is 129 countries, plus ratification by two-thirds of General Assembly member countries, including all the P5 countries, the permanent five countries. Now, Brazil's attempt to attain permanent UNSC membership during the first administration of President Lula Inácio da Silva, known as Lula, is a good illustration of the problem here. Now, his presidency began in 2002. Now, there may be people in the audience who know this story much better than I do, but this is just from my reading, and I have the sources if you'd like to see what I consulted. So, Brazil and Chile volunteered to lead the UN mission to Haiti, demonstrating good citizenship. Brazil offered favorable trade conditions and debt forgiveness to several African countries, especially Lusophone Africa. Brazil tweaks its, tweaked its foreign policy to win favor with Arab states. Brazil helped China win admission to the World Trade Organization by certifying that it had a full market economy. Brazil allied itself with what's called the aspirant four countries, uh, together with Brazil, India, Japan, and Germany, called the G4 countries. The outcome was China said no. Uh, they didn't want their regional rivals, you know, Japan and India and the Security Council. Other Latin American countries are also not enthusiastic about Brazil becoming a permanent member. Now, from talking to the different ambassadors, I learned that Uruguay and Chile, at least, uh, support the Brazilian position. They support Brazil being on the Security Council. In the past, Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Mexico have supported the United, Uniting for Consensus group, uh, really led by, by Italy. Uh, the United for Consensus group wants no new members in the Security Council. Uh, again, the, the United, for Con United for Consensus Group consists of rivals of the G4 countries, and they also have substantive reasons for their positions. 
Now, one of the ambassadors I talked to said that there should be no permanent members at all in the Security Council. He argued that being elected is what makes countries represent their region. And if they don't, you know, represent their region, the next time they may not be elected. It's an interesting argument. Anyway, Argentina and Mexico say, hey, why not me? Why Brazil? And they say, well, would Brazil really represent Latin America and the Security Council or simply represent itself? Once you're a permanent member, you're not running for election anymore. Can a Portuguese-speaking country represent all the Spanish-speaking countries? Now, Brazil is famous for having excellent diplomats, and I'm sure they would do their best to you know, help support the ideals and interests of the other countries. But when push comes to shove, countries are selfish. They have to pick themselves. You imagine running for re-election as president of Brazil, and your re-election slogan is, you know, I helped uh, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, you know, Mexico, El Salvador, and so forth. How many people are going to vote for, for you on that basis? So nationalism and national politics make countries selfish. The other regions is the same thing. Pakistan objects to India on the Security Council, a permanent member. Italy and Spain object to Germany, and there are too many European votes anyway. Uh, South Korea and Japan don't want J South Korea and China don't want Japan on the Security Council given its history in World War II. Now, why would Security Council reform make things worse the way we're currently doing it? Now, assuming that Brazil, India, Japan, and Germany become permanent members, the G4 countries, as they deserve given their size and populations, you can't simply do that because you know, you're leaving out Africa. And the Africa countries got together and they have something called the Esolini uh, Compromise uh, Consensus. And they say, we want two permanent members of the Security Council plus two temporary members. Now, which ones are they going to pick? Uh, South Africa, certainly. Uh, Nigeria. Egypt. How are they going to choose? They can't choose. Right? Plus, the, Af the, the Arab countries say, hey, we have to have a Muslim vote. Preferably, we got a Muslim vote with a, with a veto. How are they going to choose? They can't choose. Now, this proposal solves the problem because we have sub-Saharan sub Africa and we have the Middle East. And the Middle East is all Muslim countries. So Egypt is in the Middle East. By the way, uh, the big white area here is Sudan. So I predicted, you know, we, we knew five years ago that it was likely to split. It's happened. So Sudan itself, northern part of Sudan, would become part of the Middle East, and South Sudan would join the Sub-Saharan Africa group. And this, this is a wide area here. The Guyanas don't have the minimum size. Something I forgot to say is that the, uh, the countries participating in this, this voting uh, have to have a minimum size of 4 million people in the population or $40 billion PPP in constant 2008 dollars. So the many states would not participate. I choose this, chose this for two reasons. Uh, one is that if you, chose the, if you choose this cutoff, you get two-thirds of the members of the United Nations. And you need two-thirds of the members of the United Nations in order to ratify something like this, a charter, charter reform. And with the, this two-thirds, with this, with this minimum size, you get to include really important, small but important countries, like Uruguay, Costa Rica, New Zealand, Norway. Okay. So otherwise, every country in the world with a population of at least four million people and a PPP of at least $40 billion uh, per year in 2008 dollars, every country in the world would be represented on the Security Council without increasing in the size of the Security Council. Security Council today has 15 members. This would have uh, 10 members, plus some countries, some regions would have co-leaders, but you would not include, increase the size of the Security Council. But at the same time, every country in the world above this minimum size would be represented. Now today, if you add you know, Brazil, India, Japan, and China, plus two African countries, and then they say, of course, you're leaving out you know, Turkey and Indonesia and other countries which deserve to participate. Um, the African countries say, we don't like the veto, but if some countries have it, by God, we're going to have it too. So they want their veto. The, the, uh, the, the G4 countries say, we'll forego the veto for the first 10 years. Great. So after 10 years, that means you get 
11 countries with the veto power on the Security Council of the United Nations. It would be completely unoperable. I mean, it would be not look nice and pretty, and they would have these meetings in the Norwegian room and so forth, but absolutely nothing would ever get accomplished. It'd be a disaster. And this is called reform. David Bosco, in a good book called Five to Rule Them All, says that at 15 members, the council is already close to its maximum effective capacity. Former Australian Representative Peter Walensky says, quote, an unwieldy three-tiered structure could inhibit quick council action. The unwieldiness would carry with it the risk not, mele not merely that responses would be too late, but also that the major powers would become less willing to devote the time and energy needed to work through the council and would be readier to adopt unilateral action. Now, I first got interested in this about 2004 when I saw this, uh, these proposals for Security Council reform. So here's the, here's the uh, current Security Council and these two proposals for reform. Look at this. And both proposals, the permanent five, keep their seats and keep their vetoes. What? <laughs> this is a reform? You're going to keep France and Britain on the Security Council forever? completely nuts. And then you create a caste system, right? And here's, you know, the, uh, the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class. Not, not even caste, caste, right? Because it can't be changed. And it's not even any logic to the caste system in the sense that you could think, well, if the big and powerful countries are on the top caste, so no, the big and powerful countries would be here too. I mean, Japan and Germany and India and Brazil would be in the second class caste. Completely nuts. I'm not criticizing the people that made this reform. That's the best they could do politically, but it makes absolutely no sense. Now, there is one reform proposal that makes a certain amount of sense, and it's very simple. This would be to add five countries to the Security Council with a veto, but require that you need two countries to actually veto something. This, you know, this might be an improvement, but which five countries? Now, is there any way to square the circle and achieve UNSC re reform? This is what I've been thinking about for the last couple of weeks. Well, part of this. this is, I decided we have two-stage reform, stage, stage one. It seems to me the key moment is going to happen when India, Brazil, and South Africa realize they're not going to get permanent seats on the Security Council. Now, right now, the government of Brazil does not support a regional uh, representation in the Security Council like I proposed here. Why not? Because Brazil thinks, still thinks they can get a permanent seat on the Security Council. If I were president of Brazil, I would think the same thing, right? Hey, it'd be better for Brazil to have a you know, permanent seat with a veto on the Security Council than to simply be one country in Latin America, even if it is the biggest country. I would do the same thing. But they're not going to get a seat. It's not going to happen. And it seems to me the key moment is when the Brazilians realize we're not going to get a seat. And South Africa realizes we're not going to get a seat. And the Indians recognize we're not going to get a seat, even though we're going to be the biggest country in the world pretty soon in terms of population. And they're going to get angry. And that's good. Now, India, Brazil, and South Africa have cooperated on something called the IBSA Dialogue Forum. IBSA standing for India, Brazil, South Africa Dialogue Forum. Now, what can they do? It seems to me this is a real natural for India. All the Indians have to do is remember how they got their independence from Great Britain, right? Had to do with a man named Mahatma Gandhi, right? And Gandhi decided that we're just not going to cooperate with the British. We don't want a violent revolution. A violent revolution would bring up the wrong kind of leaders and so forth, as described in the really wonderful movie, Gandhi, uh, with Ben Kingsley. We're not going to cooperate with them. And a few thousand British can't rule 400 million Indians, or however many Indians there were at that time. We're not going to cooperate with them. It seems to me this is the key today. And they left, they got independence, and they left on good terms with the British, which is a fantastic accomplishment. Just astonishing. One of the major accomplishments in world history, I would think. Now, it seems to me that lots of institutions in the world look strong and solid, but they're not. Examples, the British Empire, the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, General Motors, Lehman Brothers. 
and a lot of banks that would have gone bust if it hadn't been for you know, getting rescued. Uh, and the P5 countries on the Security Council. Now, one of the remarkable things is that four of the five members of the Security Council have lost power in the recent decades. You know, Great Britain, France, and Russia have all lost their empires. The United States has declined relative to the rest of the world. Get an example of this. There's a strategic planning document from the U.S. Pentagon Defense Department dated 5 January 2012. It's called Sustaining U.S. Global Leadership Priorities for the 21st Century Defense. It states, quote, whenever possible, we will develop innovative, low-cost, and small footprint approaches to achieve our security objectives. U.S. forces will no longer be sized to conduct large-scale, prolonged stability, op stability operations. Bingo. No more Afghanistans, no more Iraqs, no more Syria, right? Well, U.S. forces will no longer be sized to conduct large-scale prolonged stability operations. Plus, we have a, you know, a deficit of over a you know, trillion dollars every year you know, since the first year of the Obama administration, left over from the George W. Bush administration. Anyway, in spite of all this, in spite of the fact that four of these five countries have lost power, they've stayed on top. I think we, maybe we should give a round of applause to the P5 countries because they've <laughs> a, a, arranged an amazing accomplishment, you know. There are 193 countries in the world and five have managed to stay on top, you know, since 1945, you know. Hey, a round of applause for, this, for the P5 countries. It's really quite remarkable. Anyway, it seems to me what the non-permanent members can do is they can stop cooperating. Now, this may be dangerous. It may damage the United Nations. It may hurt peacekeeping operations. Um, so it's not for me to decide, but it seems to me it's an important option. And this kind of um, reminds me of the concept of codependency. Now, I don't know a lot about codependency, but it seems to me that from what I, when I read, the argument is that the uh, the person in a bad marriage or bad relationship who is being beat up and you know abused is not 100% without fault because this person facilitates the relationship and keeps it going. There's the option of leaving, however difficult that may be. Now it seems to me that these 188 countries have been kind of in a codependent relationship with the P5 for all these years. So first stage reform of the Security Council. Now, Latin American countries could lead this, but I get the impression they probably won't uh, because of political reasons, but they could. There's two, anyway, there's division in, the, uh, in Latin America today. But I don't see why there should be any division on this issue because this is not an ideological issue. And the issue I'm talking about here is the issue is France and Great Britain on the Security Council. Now, I don't think we would, it would, wouldn't require the Latin American ambassadors in Canberra to lead a march to the sea to make salt like Gandhi did, but it <laughs> would require a certain amount of, of unity. More likely, it seems to me, Brazil, India, and South Africa, members of the IBSA Dialogue Forum, are all unsuccessful candidates for permanent seats on the UNSC, and they could, they could lead on this. So I've drafted the following letter from the IBSA countries to Great Britain and France, no charge for my services at all. <laughs> and here's, here's the, how the letter goes. Um, India, Brazil, and South Africa would like to thank, this, this is addressed to Great Britain and France. India, Brazil, and South Africa would like to thank you for your past service as, members of the, as permanent members of the UN Security Council. However, the entire world knows that GB in France, Great Britain and France, do not deserve permanent membership in the Council compared to other countries by virtue of their population, size of economy, and contributions to the United Nations. Now, the population of India is 1.2 million. The population of Great Britain is 63 million. The Indian economy is over twice the size of the British economy measured in terms of purchasing power parity. Okay, the letter goes on. We therefore ask you to resign your seats as permanent members of the UNSC in favor of a common seat on the Council for the European Union. You can continue to participate in the Council as members of the European Union. We're not angry with you. We simply want a more representative and legitimate Security Council. 
Well, they're just acting like normal, selfish countries, right? If Latin American countries had seats in the Security Council they didn't deserve in terms of population and size of their economy, they would do the same thing, right? This is the way countries act. Now, the last part of the letter is, if you do not resign your seats as of such and such date, we will progressively reduce our participation in UN activities. We will decide to stop applying for two-year temporary membership in the UNSC. As a last resort, we will reduce or cancel our financial and peacekeeping contributions to the United Nations. We anticipate the support of other countries in this effort. Sincerely yours, India, Brazil, South Africa. <laughs> Now, I would think, logically, obviously I can't speak for these countries, but logically I would think a lot of other countries would sign up on this. Argentina, which is no great friend of Great Britain these days because of the Malvinas uh, <laughs> Falkland Islands conflict. Uh, Pakistan, yeah. normally Pakistan's a rival of India, but I don't see why it should be in this case. Egypt, why not Australia? It's a perfect time for Australia because Australia is on the Security Council now. It may not be there for another 25 years, right? So it doesn't lose anything. Argentina the same, Guatemala the same, Colombia just got off the council. They're not losing anything by signing on to this. It's not an ideological issue. Now the IBSA countries have a total of 12,086 contributors to U.S. peacekeeping operations as of March 13, 31st, 2013, police troops and military experts. Pakistan supplies another 8,251 people. Argentina has 879. Egypt has 3,053. This is out of a total of 92,541 peacekeepers and all right now. Now, if these three countries uh, withdraw their support, well, we can ask Great Britain and France to uh, take over, you know? Why not just support another 12,086 uh, contributors with all their economic problems they have today? This would put a tremendous amount of pressure on Great Britain and France because they know they're wrong. They're wrong. Everybody in the world knows that they're wrong. They don't deserve to be on the council, and there's a good option which is a common seat for the European Union. Now, small states will definitely step in and take the place of the large states, no problem. And I wouldn't ask the small states to stop applying for temporary membership to the Security Council because it's in their interest. You don't ask countries to do things which is not in their interest. Small states get a lot out of being on the Security Council. You know, you get a lot of visibility, a lot of prestige, and more of that. Uh, you get foreign aid and, and trade benefits. This has been proven by some economists. They've studied this. And for two years, you get a lot of benefits out of this. But what would this do to the credibility of the Security Council of the United Nations? It would consist of the P5 countries plus a bunch of little countries. Make it much worse than it is today. So the lecture's not over yet, and we've already gotten rid of Great Britain, France, and Security Council. <laughs> we've established a common European seat. This solves a number of problems. It solves the problem of German representation, and the Germans have said they will accept a single European seat. It strengthens the European Union, which needs all the help it can get these days. It writes an historic wrong of the British still lording over the Indians, uh, the South Africans, the Pakistanis, and the French over their former colonies. It reduces European overrepresentation in the Security Council. It makes, easier, it makes it easier to implement these REP plans for UNSC reform because we need a common European seat. And it shows something can be done for the first time since 1945, practically. Now, second stage reform, I have about five minutes left. I'll go through this quickly. We need to do, stop doing things bass backwards, as we say in Texas. That means backwards in standard English. Uh, what we've been doing, we've been saying, well, what's, what's best for my country? How can I increase this, the prestige of my country? We should start out with saying, hey, what's a good plan for Security Council reform? And then, how can we implement it? And we have a plan which has already stood the test of time, it seems to me, at least in the last five years. I would only change one thing in the past five years. I would make that percentage go from 18 percent to 16 percent. Now, adopting the RAP would require amending the Charter of the United Nations. Uh, this can be done by calling a general conference of the United Nations, and this can't be vetoed. It requires only nine votes in the Security Council to call a general conference of the United Nations. Of course, this is opening Pandora's box. It could destroy the United Nations. Um, it could be that the current you know, system is better than no working council. 
Anyway, it seems to me what you should do is you should have a preliminary conference like Dumbarton Oaks to prepare the way. If there's an agreement in the preliminary conference, then you can go ahead. If there's no agreement, you forget about it. Anyway, a preliminary conference, figure out what to do. Adopt this plan or some other plan. Now, what if one of the major countries in the, the P5 countries says, we're not going to go along with this. We're going to veto it. Then you can say, great. We're all going to resign from the United Nations tomorrow, and we're going to create an identical organization in Singapore or, or whatever, and you can have this, uh, this pretty building uh, in, in New York. You know, here's the, you know, the pretty building in New York and so forth. Yeah. You can have this pretty building in New York, but it'll be empty. And we'll leave a seat at the table for you guys. You know, you can come and join us anytime you want to. We'll have a new United Nations. Maybe you could be in Singapore. Perhaps you can have the, uh, uh, the Security Council in London and the General Assembly in Paris. I mean, a lot of people love to leave and live in Paris, right? And shuttle back and forth. We'll have our own organization, and you guys can join us if you want to. Now, I have one final uh, request. Uh, Anklas would appreciate that any diplomats in, the, in attendance uh, stick around for uh, refreshments and conversation rather than rushing back to your respective embassies to cable support for this uh, two-stage plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, what I've tried to do is come up with something that at least is conceivably can be done. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, you could make all sorts of good arguments for, you know, what countries should be on the Security Council based on their, their good countries, they've done good things in the world and so forth, although they can always change their government and they can stop being good countries. You know. um, but it seems to me that I've taken a basically realist position that you have to work with the world it is, like it is. And you have to represent the countries in the world like they are. Um, and the second question was, uh, you can remind me. Too about how the Security oh, the, Council continues yeah. to Yeah, the General Assembly. Uh, the General Assembly seems to me is one great example of an organization, international organization that doesn't work because it doesn't represent, it isn't, doesn't represent the, wor the world the way it is. I mean, Mauritius has the same vote as China on the General Assembly. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. How can you operate? Why should anybody pay any attention to resolutions from countries, some of them have less than a thousand people. Um, and the United States doesn't have to pay any attention to the General Assembly's position on General Assembly. Uh, therefore, it doesn't, you know. It doesn't affect public opinion, it doesn't affect politics in the United States. People ignore it. One of the things I've noticed being outside the United States is that the UN is much more visible uh, outside the United States. Most of its operations are outside the United States. And the, the publicity you get in the United States is often very negative. You know, if, you, if you want to find negative stuff on, a, on the United Nations, look at the Fox News so far. Uh, it's, it's not a popular organization in the United States. So I wouldn't want this proposal to be proposed by the United States. One, they wouldn't do it. And two, all sorts of other countries would be against it. Seems to me have small countries, medium-sized countries. Um, anyway, the third, what was the third question? About the veto power, yeah, a number of people, you know, get, argue against the veto. One of the curious things is that some people have argued that the veto power is the only thing that kept the United Nations together. Uh, in fact, the United States and Russia, or Soviet Union in those days, would not have entered the organization without the veto power. And even though the, the Soviets, um, you know, used the veto power a lot, you know, that was their reason for, for staying in there. Uh, Talking to Ambassador Viagra, he, he mentioned the case in uh, during the Korean War where the uh, the Soviet Union boycotted uh, the uh, Security Council, and then the Security Council then took a position to defend South Korea and so forth. They made a big mistake. So it seems to me you can't simply boycott, you know, by, by one country. But anyway, the all these non-permanent members don't have the veto anyway. But it seems to me this is one of the strong points of this proposal that it doesn't have a veto power. The original idea of the United Nations was that um, Soviet Union 
and the United States and Great Britain were all involved in the, in the Second World War, and they wanted to try to do something to prevent World War III. Uh, they wanted, didn't want to fail like the League of Nations failed, in part because the United States never joined the League of Nations. And they thought that if the three big powers can keep together, they can keep wars from happening in other places. But then, of course, it split. Uh, you did have sort of one magic moment after the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union where the Security Council worked the way it was supposed to work. And you got this um, resolution to, uh, to def defend Kuwait after Saddam Hussein took out Kuwait. You got the cooperation of the Western countries plus Russia, a bunch of, plus a bunch of Middle Eastern countries, and they limited what they did to, to, they limited themselves to simply liberating Kuwait. They didn't try to take out Saddam Hussein. Seems to me the thing worked very well, except for the, the war ended about two days too soon. So they didn't take out the uh, Republican Guard of Saddam Hussein, and then they called for uprising, and Saddam Hussein massacred these people. But it seems to me for a magic moment there, the, you know, the Security Council worked very well. I would encourage you to read this, a lot of good books on the Security Council, this book uh, Five to, to Rule Them All. I think it's a very, very good history up until, I don't know, I think it's 2009.